So, good afternoon <clears throat> and welcome everyone for our short discussion here. <clears throat> and so, first of all, thank you very much for having me here at Google and for your time to listen more about Googling. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> um, if we look at our world today, it's changing faster than what we can get hold of, the things that we already have. You know, the moment we think we got hold of something, it's already changed for the next and the next and the next. And so it's uh, <clears throat> moving so fast that becoming harder and harder for our mind to catch up with. And we have so much information on online, uh, especially on Google, so that, you know, <clears throat> uh, if you think about the information that we have, uh, the amount of information that we have, and the mind that we experience here, who can process that information, there's actually a big gap between the two, right? The world out there in the internet and the world in general in a changing, pa changing pace here and the mind th that is trying to catch up with this, the whole thing. And so <clears throat> at the end, you know, what we are really chasing after <clears throat> in this high speed, uh, I'm not talking about the internet, but high speed <laughs> mentally and physically that what we are really chasing after throughout the generations, throughout the centuries is like, you know, seems like we're chasing after some kind of happiness, isn't it? And, <clears throat> and so that chasing after happiness is there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. And we want it to happen faster and faster. Like we want to get happy faster. Right? We want to get happy now. And we want to have instant happiness, like instant noodle that we have, or instant gratification that we are all seeking for actually is becoming a big problem for us. You know, because of this uh, sort of mentality of looking for instant gratification and the fast, uh, or the faster than our mind can achieve something you know, we want to achieve, that is becoming a problem for us in terms of achieving that sense of happiness. Actually, what it actually is doing is, is counterproductive it's actually bringing us more suffering because of that, uh, because of this sense of speed, sense of uh, like the instant gratification that we are looking for. So anyway, everybody seems to be talking about happiness, right? In countries like Bhutan, uh, they talk about gross national happiness, right? And then, of course, in Google you have uh, a lot of discussions about happiness and who's the happiest man and so on. So I think we all agree on chasing after happiness, right? Anybody disagrees? Anybody don't want happiness? <laughs> I was recently talking <clears throat> to some of my friends and one of them told me like they actually don't want happy uh, happiness. So I was a little shocked and I didn't know what to say. If you think about how one becomes happy, okay, can you take a moment and think about how you can, uh, how you usually experience happiness? What makes you happy? Uh, take a moment and think about it. What does that happiness look like? You know, when we say happiness. And we're looking for something, right? Happiness. So what is it? What do you feel when you think about happiness? What is it that you're looking for? 
Is it the next Google phone? Another car? Another friend? Uh, you know, when you think about it, <clears throat> happiness is actually something that depends on individual mind, isn't it? What is happiness for me is not necessarily happiness for you. What is happiness for you is not necessarily happiness for me. And so we all think we are looking for the same thing called happiness. But actually, we're not sure what we are talking about. What is this happiness? You know? What is this happiness we're looking for? But at the end, uh, it really depends on your own mind state, isn't it? Whether you can be happy or not depends on your mind state. It's not dependent on the outer environment, gadgets, uh, material wealth, even friends. You know, it's not really that. At the end, it's really something we are talking. What, what we are really talking about here is a state of mind. Happiness is a state of mind. Since it is a state of mind, it is your individual state of mind, isn't it? Right? It cannot be a national state <laughs> state of mind. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, you know, we can't have that national state of mind. That's kind of scary, isn't it? If you have a national state of mind, it's individual state of mind. And so it really depends on individual, individual mind. And so, um, so what is happiness is something that you have to find it in your own state of mind, right? It's not something that someone else can give you. Someone else may can help you to find it. But at the end, we are the ones who have to actually discover that, to find that in our own mind state. And so therefore the key, <clears throat> the key here for achieving our goal of happiness, for the key here for us to achieve the state of a mind that is uh, capable of achieving anything we want to achieve in our life depends on how healthy your mind is. You know, whether uh, we're talking about in relationship, relationship with our parents, our children, our partners, uh, co-workers, or whether we talk about in relationship with our achievement in in our goal in a mundane life, or whether we talk about achievement in your spiritual journey individually, it all really depends on how well uh, we can work with our mind. And so mind is the important piece here that we usually miss in our equation of thinking about who we are, or what we can achieve or how we can achieve. Usually mind is something we kind of ignore. Isn't that the case, right? When we're talking about getting somewhere, we're always thinking about car, public transportation, and most importantly, the Google app, right? When we want to get somewhere. We're not thinking about our mind at all. We're thinking about all these other things but our mind. And so therefore, you know, what's the most important thing here <clears throat> uh, in terms of achieving anything we want to achieve here is to first, first thing we need to do is we need to Google what is mind, <laughs> right? We need to Google what is mind. And many times when I give public talks and stuff like that, people ask me like, how can I find my teacher, or where can I find a guru, or something like that? And I say, Google it. 
And so the first thing we need to Google here is we need to Google our mind. You know, what is mind? Right? What is mind? You know, mind is our most precious and valuable resource that we have. You know, through which we experience every single moment of our life, right? With this mind. And the mind that we rely upon to be happy, right? When we think about, I want to be happy, we are relying on our mind to be happy. And we are relying on our mind to be content. And we are relying, relying on our mind to be emotionally stable, if there are such things, uh, emotionally stable uh, individuals. And at the same time, uh, to be kind, thoughtful, considerate in our relationships with others. And this is the same mind <clears throat> that we depend upon to be focused, right? To be focused, to be creative, uh, to be productive, right? When we want to be productive, we're talking about actually our mind. We're looking at our mind to be more productive, and we're looking at our mind to be spontaneous. Um, and perform at our best, in the very best in everything we, uh, we do. But at the same time, we don't take time to look after this mind at all. Do we? Right? Look like, you know, we have 24 hours a day. Like, where do you spend most of your time? We, took, we take care of our body quite well in general, right? Especially at the coast, <laughs> two coasts, <laughs> east coast and the west coast. <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, whole foods, whole paycheck. Um, and you know, we take care of our body, and we do really take care of our cars, right? Don't we? We take care of our cars, we make sure, you know, we take it to the, what do you call that? Mechanic. Yeah. Maintenance. Car wash. Detail. Maintenance. <laughs> Detail. <laughs> Maintenance, right? Actually, recently I got a used truck. Uh, I live in Washington State. Uh, I got a used truck from, strangely, you know, I got a used Chevy truck at Cadillac dealer. And what I was really happy about is a lifetime free car wash. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a part of the deal. And so I was so happy, and I was talking to my friends and people. And then at some point, I realized, like, this is how we take care of our mind. <laughs> you know, we worry about the truck getting washed every now and then. But do we ever? Think about taking care of our mind, you know? Like, we do take pretty good care of our clothes, right? Like, we have different baskets. Some goes into dry cleaning, some goes into laundry, and some goes into whatever. But our mind, in 24 hours, we pay very little attention to our mind. We, we, we do very little about um, taking care of the maintenance of this mind. But we still expect so much from our mind, right? The mind is like our slave for 24 seven, right? We want our mind to work, we want our mind to be happy, we want our mind to be high, achieve, high achiever, we, all, we want our mind to be focused, but, but there's no maintenance is done uh, in terms of our mind. And so therefore, first thing, you know, that becomes really important in terms of development of joy, of happiness, of, uh, uh, of, of getting any kind of uh, compassionate action or any kind of productivity is to have a healthy mind. And so, <clears throat> um, so how we can 
work with our mind is first Google your mind before you Google anything else. Okay? What is Rumbach's mind? And so when you Google, <clears throat> uh, Google will actually tell you what is your mind. You know, your individual mind. Right? I think you all know Google, so I think yeah, you know better than me. But if you look at your search history, okay? If you look at your search history, if you look at the history of your you know, computer, <laughs> right? The usage. And if you, can you imagine like if you save all the search histories, you know, ever since you, know, you were born, think about it, like your, your mind's always searching something, right? Outside all the time. If you think about the whole search history together, look at your own search history. That is the result when you Google what is your mind. Right? You can see there. You can see a pattern there, isn't it? In that search history, and if there's a program that can actually show how many times you know, your history is related to what kind of emotions or what kind of thought you know, uh, frame, positive thought, negative thought, if you look at it, you can see a whole history of your mind right there in the search history. And so search is not only uh, in terms of physical search on a computer, on a device, but search in terms of in your own thought processes. If you look at the search that you do <clears throat> in your mind, you're searching for truth, you're searching for happiness, you're searching for this, you're searching for used truck, right? Actually, I must tell you, Google was helpful finding my used truck to buy. And so, like that, you know, we are searching, our mind is searching outside all the time, right? So if you look at your mind's search history, so to speak, if there's a program that can put together the history of your search into some categories, then you can tell uh, you can tell clearly from that search history your identity, right? Can it tell, uh, define <laughs> your mind frame, your identity, and your profile? It can also tell your habits, how many times you have searched for certain things. Um, it can actually tell our mind's behavior. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> who are you when you search your mind? Okay, who are you? Who are we? You know, when we search, what is our mind? Who are we? Is it, you know, are you defined by your skill, your talent? Is that who you are? Or are you defined by your families, or religious background, or just simply a search history, right? So who are we, you know? But actually, <clears throat> uh, what you can find from searching our mind is we can actually find who we are, right? Who is who is this person? What is our mind? And so therefore, you know, uh, I think I shouldn't talk, go on too long about searching here. <laughs> and so therefore from the search history, you can tell <clears throat> actually uh, it kind of shows your mind or your habitual tendencies, okay? And it can define who you are, the profile. So don't they anyway, you know, don't they profile you from your search history, right? And so you can tell from there, uh, if you search insight, as Ming has pointed out so many times, <clears throat> if you search yourself inside, 
you can see clearly. And so anyway, when you look in that way, you can see that our mind is so empowered and controlled by habit, right? by our habit all the time. Our biggest problem is habit, isn't it? It's not about our wisdom. We are very smart people. People are smart. People have wisdom, and people know what they want to do, what's good to do, you know, what's most beneficial to do. But the problem here is the habit that is obstructing us from achieving that, you know, achieving that goal, achieving that uh, positive state of mind. And so therefore, habit is not being, for example, habit is not being able to sit in the present, right? Being in the present, sitting quiet, doing nothing, it's very scary, isn't it? That's the most scariest thing. <laughs> if you have to sit in the present moment and, and do nothing, that's scary. That's why we always like to do something. You know, what I've heard recently on NPR, <clears throat> you know, some uh, cyber psychology research showed that the average person in America looks at their phone 200 times a day. Okay, they're looking at the phone 200 times. Not about like how much time you spend, but picking up the phone and looking at it, like 200 times, average people. So from that you can tell <clears throat> that we like to do something and get distracted rather than being focused. Whether we talk about working, whether we talk about working with our mind, working with our projects, anything. Our mind is more habituated in scattered thoughts and distraction. And some recent um, research from Harvard University shows that the average person is distracted uh, or lost in thoughts or distracted 47% uh, each day. You know, 47% is distracted or lost in thoughts. Can you imagine that, 47%? So that gives us how much left? Uh, 53% 53. Huh? 53, 53 left. And out of 53, we have to sleep a little bit, right? So take out some time for sleeping. And then how much is left? And then from there, you know, uh, so if you really narrow it down, look, our mind being focused is very little. You know, so can you imagine, like, if you can focus 47% of the time in a day, you know, how much productive can you be? You, know, you can be really productive in any kind of achievement you want to achieve. Compassionate action, love, kindness, or a good app. I'm talking about meditation app, I'm, no, any app. Uh, and so therefore you can see our mind is really distracted. And the problem with the distraction is mind wandering in all uh, scattered places is actually the direct cause, is the direct cause of unhappiness. Okay. It's the direct cause of unhappiness. Uh, you know, we feel that we will be happier somewhere else all the time, don't we? Right? We were sitting here in this room, we feel like, oh, it's, I'll be much happier if I'm sitting in the sun out there, drinking beer. And when you're out there in the sun drinking beer and then looking inside here, you might feel, <laughs> I'll be much happier if I'm there uh, doing something else. And so our mind always jumping and moving around all the time. And this is, what we call in the, the Buddhist teachings or philosophy, <clears throat> um, poverty mentality, right? Poverty mentality. And there's a sense of discontentment all the time, right? This sense of discontentment makes our mind move. You know, because we are discontent, we're looking for something else. So because we are looking for something else, you know, then we, our mind getting more distracted, then it becomes 47% or more, right? 47% is average. <clears throat> and recent studies at also UC Davis uh, have 
found that uh, <clears throat> our mind is primarily uh, stuck in negative thinking. Okay, our mind feels more comfortable in negative thinking than positive thinking. So our mind is more deeply rooted in negative uh, thought pattern, usually. Um, so the UC Davis uh, studies show that you know, they did this uh, research with, uh, you know, usually like group A, group B, you know, same amount of people, and then they had this uh, kind of like medical treatment as a um, thing to do the research here. And so they asked group A and, and told them that this medical treatment has 70% uh, of success. Uh, and so everybody had positive thought about it. They all say like, you know, if I have to do it, if I, in, in that situation, I will definitely you know, take this treatment. And then they went to group B and told them that, you know, uh, this treatment has 30% chance of failure, <laughs> right? Like in the research, how they do. And so th that group thought like, oh, they had negative thought about it. And they, they thought like, you know, they really don't want to do it if they have to do it and so forth and so on. And then they went back to the group A and told them that not only 70%, you know, success rate, but also there's a 30% chance of failure. And then they changed their mind right away, from positive to negative. So most of them in the group A thought they had a negative thought about it now. And even though their first thought was positive, right? And then they went back to the group B and told them it's not only like 30% uh, failure rate, but also 70% you know, success. But you know what? They didn't change their mind. They stayed <laughs> negative. They stayed negative. And so the studies show that changing from positive to negative is just an instant. You know, our mind is habituated in that way. It flips right away. It doesn't take that long to flip. But flipping from negative to positive is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. That's what we call habit, you know. A repetitive habit, habitual pattern here. And so <clears throat> the UC Davis studies show also that uh, it takes three positive thoughts to balance with one negative thought, just to balance. Okay? We're not talking about transforming or changing or anything, even just to balance. You, know, you need three positive thoughts for one negative thought. You know? And so Therefore, you know, if you don't take care of our mind here and direct our mind positively, it is pretty clear that our usual habit in general is to get stuck in a negative space. You know, get stuck in a negative space, and then that's where you don't find any sense of happiness, joy, or achievement. So. And therefore, you know, the, the reason why we get stuck in such a negative thought pattern is because of our habitual mind. And what we are habituated, usually, is we are habituated in labeling process, right? Labeling process. Uh, anything we experience, we need to label. What we see, what we hear, what we experience. We always mix that with labels. And we mix that with uh, thought processes. And so when you mix them with the thought processes here, then you lose the original power or the original experience. So what you're experiencing here is a labeled experience, which is like experiencing a processed food. Right? When you have a processed food, then it's mixed with colors and artificial flavor. Of course, it tastes much better. I love them better. I love, love them better than the raw vegetables. But you, know, you see the difference, right? The nutrition is different. The power is different. And so therefore, 
when our mind is habituated in labeling everything, especially negative labeling, as you can see from the studies, then that's how we get actually stuck in unhappiness. That's how we get stuck in confusion. You know, that's how we get stuck in the sense of uh, spinning around, chasing after our own tail, <laughs> going around and around like you know our cats do. Uh, and so one of the key element in our everyday life when you search mind is you find so much, uh, so many experiences of emotions, right? Emotion is a big piece in our mind, experience of mind. Um, <clears throat> do you agree? Or is it just me? You know, emotion is a big piece in our experience of mind. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I've had a lot of experiences with emotions myself. When I was young, especially when I was in teenage, <clears throat> um, after the, the, yeah, anyway, I won't go into details, but <clears throat> I had a lot of emotions when I was a teenage and struggling like anyone else with emotions during my teen. But at that time, you know, I met my teacher and had um, some help and support from his uh, love and wisdom and through which I managed to work with my emotions <clears throat> uh, a little bit, you know. I'm not saying I'm free of emotions now, so please don't test me. <laughs> <laughs> but I managed to uh, work with my emotions a little bit. And so, therefore, you know, <clears throat> uh, working with emotions becomes part of actually working with our mind. Okay, when you search mind, you see a lot of emotions there. Because every thought has some emotions. Okay, every thought has some uh, color. Every thought has some touch of certain emotions, whether they are, you know, uh, obvious or dormant there is an emotion behind every thought, you know. It usually reminds me of this Godfather novel. You know Godfather? Uh, I read this novel in India when I was you know, quite young. And the first page, <laughs> they had this quote, quotation saying, behind every great fortune there is a crime. So every time when I think about emotion, it's like that, you know. <laughs> behind every thoughts, behind every movement of our mind, there's a little emotion going on there, you know. Little emotions. And so our life is full of emotions, right? Uh, which is a good thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, because life without emotions is like a flat soda, right? Who wants to drink a flat soda? So life with emotions is like a real soda with bubbles. And so therefore emotions are not really uh, negative by nature, but they become negative when they're mixed with thought processes. Right? When they're mixed with thought processes, uh, when our experience of emotion becomes searching outside towards the object of emotions rather than looking at the energy and the power of emotions themselves, right? That's when the emotions become problem. You know, when you experience emotions, usually you're focusing on the object of that emotion, right? You're not looking at the emotion or emotional energy inwardly, but we're always looking outside towards the object of that emotion and thinking, oh, what he did wrong, or what she did wrong, or what, you know, uh, 
the world did wrong to you. And so then there's so much focus outside. And so you lose the perspective of true experience of this energy of our emotions. And so when you look at the energy of emotions themselves, it is actually quite awakening energy. You know, energy of emotions is like the electrical current that is always present in the wire. But whether we can tap into that energy or not is up to us. Um, so anyway, I think there's a lot to talk about here, but maybe not much time. Um, so what I want to say here is like not only we search our mind or Google the mind, but we should also Google the Googler, right? We should also search the searcher. Who's searching, right? First we search the mind outside and then search, uh, not search, but look at the searcher or the Google, the Googler. Does that make sense? And then see what you find when you Google the Googler. Who's the Googler, right? Uh, these days, you know, we have a lot of awareness about our mind and mindfulness. So I don't feel like I think, you know, I need to speak about mindfulness. I think you have great <clears throat> uh, classes here and training with the uh, search, uh, search yourself inside Ming and the Google uh, team here. And so I don't need to talk about mindfulness here, but <clears throat> you know what I feel uh, kind of compelled to say a little bit here is that uh, sometimes our mindfulness becomes too focused, you know, too squeezed, squeezed attention, right? When you focus too much on mindfulness, sometimes that has a counterproductive, you know? Like, for example, when you think too much about not making mistake, that's when you make more mistakes, right? Uh, do you remember like writing with pen and paper in the old days? But now, now you can delay it and stuff like that is easy, you know. Uh, my life in India when I grew up, it's just pen and paper. But, you know, we even had to make our own pens. That's, that's how I was trained, making like these bamboo pens and calligraphy. And so, I mean, I love it. And there's a beauty to that. You can smell the bamboo and you, you you know, you're making your pen, your own pen, and I didn't quite learn how to make paper, but, um, <clears throat> but they do teach that. And so anyway, so remember like when you write calligraphy in that way, more you focus and more you think like, I shouldn't make mistake, then that's when you make the mistake, right? That's when I make the mistake. And so more we think we need to be mindful, you know, focus, narrowly, right? Squeeze your attention so hard. When you try so hard, sometimes that has counterproductive. And so mindfulness needs some sense of relaxation, you know, a balance of relaxation. Um, balance of relaxation. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, some tradition of meditation in the East, uh, like from Tibetan tradition, uh, even say that, you know, one and only thing you really need is relaxation. That's all you need. If you can relax, that's enough, you know. But can you imagine totally relaxing, right? Totally relaxing is almost not possible, right? But when somebody tells you to be mindful, you feel like, no, I can't be mindful, you know. But when somebody tells you to relax, then we feel like, I can't relax, I have to focus. <laughs> My mind needs all this focus. And so you can see, you know, the shifts between focusing and relaxing is already there in your mind's makeup. It's nothing new you need to find from outside. It's already there, right? Can you see? 
Like when someone tells you to one pointedly focus, we feel like I can't do that. My mind kind of is spacious, goes, goes into all this kind of space. And, but then when somebody tells you to completely relax and don't focus at all, then we feel like I can't do that. I, my mind goes into this, you know, um, my mind goes to this object or flower or person or whatnot, a thought, right? And so these two things are already there as part of your mind's makeup, you know? And so you need to balance the two in terms of uh, finding, in terms of discovering our mind and, and, the, uh, and the awareness that's looking at the mind, right? You need the balance between mindfulness and relaxation. Uh, focus, yet relax. Relaxed, but not distracted, you know? And that, that's the key, and that's the, that's the hardest piece here. Because uh, just to do one is easy, but to have the balance is not, is not, that, uh, it's not that easy. And so working with our emotions begins with working with a sense of mindfulness. You know, mindful, we need the sense of a gap. Um, and when we have the gap or the space between you and your emotions, then you have an opportunity or possibility of seeing your emotions clearly. And once you can see your emotions clearly, then you have a possibility of letting go of that uh, emotion that's bothering you. you know? uh, there's no way we can let go without seeing that emotion clearly, emotions clearly. And so I want to read you this last thing, letting go peace. Um, I like this story. Is it okay I read this to you? A psychologist walked around a room while teaching stress management to an audience. As she raised a glass of water, everyone expected they'd be asked the half empty, half full question. Instead, with a smile on her face, she inquired, how heavy is the glass of water? Answers called out ranged from one, eight ounce to 20 ounce. She replied, the absolute weight doesn't matter. It depends on how long I hold it. If I hold it for a minute, it's not a problem. If I hold it for an hour, I'll have an ache in my arm. If I hold it for a day, my arm will feel numb and paralyzed. In each case, the weight of the glass doesn't change, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. She continued, the, stress, the stresses and worries in life are like that glass of water. Think about them for a while and nothing happens. Think about them a bit longer and they begin to hurt. And if you think about them all day long, you will feel paralyzed, incapable of doing anything. It's important to remember to let go of your stresses as early in the evening as you can. Put all your burdens down, don't carry them through the evening and into the night. Remember to put the glass down. So I like this analogy of letting go. You know, uh, the Buddhist meditation teaching always says that uh, we need to let go of our clinging, our grasping, you know, holding on to things. Uh, and so the letting go piece is uh, really the hardest part of our practice, I think. Uh, hardest thing to do in our life, right, letting go. That's where you can see, uh, you know, how many junk we collect at home, right? Some empty yogurt containers, we wash them and keep them, thinking we will use them for a flower or something. Uh, so, you know, we collect all kinds of junk. Uh, in the same way, we're collecting all kinds of junk in our thought, in our mind, that we need to let go. Otherwise, we become a mental hoarder. 
Right? We're hoarding all kinds of negative thoughts, all kinds of emotions. If we don't clean, if we don't let go, then it becomes problematic. Like, you know, you need to clean the search history from time to time. Right? Or, or what do you call that? Cash? 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 Uh, I mean, I'm not really a computer person, but uh, I'm one of the persons that you are trying to uh, you know, make, make me use the product that you developed. So I've been using a lot of Google products. <clears throat> it's been pretty good. Um, Is there a complaint department somewhere? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no complaints. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Google Maps are excellent. And so I'd like to thank you all very much. And especially, I want to thank our host here, Tom, for having me here. And uh, I want to thank you, Ming, for your excellent work with the Search Inside Yourself and all the program that continues here at the Google campus. And so one last thing I want to say is like, <clears throat> when you do meditation, if you're a meditator, okay, uh, when you do meditation, you're usually working with breath, for example, right? The breathing in, breathing out, you're focusing on the breath. You're trying to concentrate your mind there. You're trying to relax your mind there through breathing, uh, through one-pointed focus, through relaxation. And then from time to time, Look at the looker inwardly, OK? Not always looking at the, the breath or any kind of meditative uh, techniques you use from all kind of world wisdom tradition. But sometimes you look at the observing mind itself, observer. And sometimes when you have emotions, don't just label it. Don't just look at the object of your emotions, but look at the energy, the experience or emotion that you feel inside of your heart. Uh, and see the energy, connect with the energy, and pause right there, you know? Uh, one of the biggest problems we see in our uh, American culture <clears throat> is that we always try to express everything, right? And that, that is good. Expressing is good. It's nothing bad. But expressing can take place a little bit later, OK? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit later. Just take a few moments you know, before you express. Uh, that can save you a lot of trouble <laughs> and money, uh, right? Sometimes you express too early, and that costs so much therapy, and it's expensive. Uh, so I think uh, it's important for us to take a minute and look at our own experience of emotions uh, before we try to share or experience that with anyone, you know. Uh, positively or negatively, it doesn't matter. Just take a moment to feel it. Good emotions, feel it for a moment. Bad emotions, feel it for a moment. And then you have plenty of time to share. Thank you. Um, I just really, um, really want to thank you for your teaching today. I really like your teaching on like post for a minute and also like let it go. But you know, it's really hard to achieve happiness all the time in your life, right? It's really hard, especially when we see that sometimes even our some of our greatest masters will have troubles. You know, maybe you're aware that some something happened to Zhang Gong Kangzhou Rinpoche recently. Oh yes. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any comments on that? On what? Uh, he, he, yeah, yeah. His problem. Mm. Uh, I think I think the challenges, you know, as myself being a Buddhist and practitioner and also teacher, the challenges are uh, across the board. You know, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or not, or you know. Uh, whether you're in a monastery or not, uh, the challenges are the same, but they appear in different forms. You know, uh, sometimes you feel like you know, oh, you know, it would be so nice to become a monk, but 
the monk is worse than like where you are now sometimes, right? And sometimes you feel like, oh, it's really so nice to be a lay person and do something, but then probably it's better for you to be at the monastery. And so it really, uh, it really uh, the challenges come in all different forms. And, and we all need to find a way to deal with that, right? And recently, I think you're talking about the one young lama leaving the monastery. I think that happens quite often in general. And I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's nothing, nothing wrong in some sense because it's individual choice. You know, if, if, uh, what kind of path that uh, each teacher wanted to manifest or choose is up to, up to that person, yeah. I have a question. Thank you for coming today. Yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> what, what's a useful way to view emotions in general in a balanced way, mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, like, I'm not particularly in touch with my own emotions as much. It takes some effort to detect and, and be aware of them. Mm -hmm. And some people I know are very much driven by their emotions, and they're very fr present and at the front of their um, consciousness. Like, what's a, and so I tend to think that with less emotional drive, I'm, I act more rationally or more carefully. Oh, see, yeah. But maybe that's not necessarily mm -hmm. a, po a positive, balanced way. Like, what's, right. what's a good way you would say to, to view emotions? <clears throat> um, I think, it's, I think it's, it's no problem. You know, if there's no emotion, it's good news. Uh, I mean, not bad emotions. It, it's good news. It's no problem with that. Uh, but if we are intentionally blocking our emotion, thinking it's not good to have emotions, then I think there's a problem there. Uh, if the emotions are coming and you have this presence of like, let's say anger all the time or some sense of jealousy, then it's good to connect with that energy rather than you know, pushing it down. Uh, or rather, rather than thinking some philosophically or religiously that this is not right or not good thing to have. But actually, the energy of anger is beautiful. It's, it's positive. There's nothing wrong with that. So the balance here is if they are present, appreciate them and try to work with that energy. And when they are not present, appreciate the absence of the emotions and then uh, work with the rational mind and what have you. So not invite them necessarily you know, when they're not there, <laughs> but then not reject them when they're present. That's the balance, I think. 